Well, we come to the end of our sermon series for such a time as this, seven lessons for living in pandemic times. And let me tell you that just because there are seven lessons in the series doesn't mean that we stop learning the lessons of living in these times. But we began the series thinking about the strength and fortitude of one Queen Esther, for whom the book of the Bible is written. Remember young Queen Esther saved the entire Jewish community in Persia from extinction? She is one of the great biblical heroines that demonstrates how to respond in the face of great crisis. Her uncle Mordecai speaks to the new Queen Esther and beseeches her to use her position to save their people and, quote, not keep silence at such a time as this. And so I think these words ring true. Maybe you were made to be queen for such a time as this, unquote. In other words, in this moment, God has given you to step up and to step out and to lead. Will you embrace that moment? Will you be a leader God has called you to be? Or will you shrink from your responsibility and hide in your silence? These are questions that came to us at the very beginning of this sermon series. They're powerful questions that hit each one of us and in some ways can indict us when our help is needed. What might it mean for the people of Queen Esther's time to live in a new way, to be led by, to a new imagination of faithful living, different from what they knew before? What would that be like? Remember the past, restore an identity, and renew a sense of community. Well, maybe you've had a chance to ponder some of those questions posed earlier in this series. Maybe you've been in a place where you can step up and speak out. And when you have the opportunity to do so, will you? And when faced with an opportunity to speak truth in love, do you? Now, a lot has happened in our world and in our lives since we began this series. Two political conventions have raised the collective national temperature and the collective national blood pressure and have set the political season and the presidential season into hyperdrive. It is the kickoff to more political ads and campaigning before November 3rd's election where we will choose what kind of leader will lead our nation for the next four years. There are also daily protests for racial equality across the United States and in our communities. There are racial tensions that have been heightened on our streets and more people are awakened to the cries for inequity and the need for systemic reform. Also this summer, more unarmed black men have been shot at the hands of police on the streets of American cities. Too many times. A new video emerged just this week of another black man, Daniel Prude, who died at the hands of police in Rochester, New York, months ago. It happened after his brother had called for assistance with a mental health crisis. There are economic disasters and business hardships, millions of us unemployed, essential workers finally seen for what they do and celebrated for their work environments that now, because of COVID-19, essential workers still are more at risk. The fight for the soul of America continues. Chaos seems to be all around us. And surely you have turned your calendar to the month of September and after much debate and delay and even protest at some school board meetings, school administrators and teachers and families have made difficult and calculated decisions about education this year. Teachers balance new protocols, new students in remote learning, all the while assisting their own children at home trying to learn. Parents try to juggle work from home and the remote learning of their children, multiple multiple computers, multiple learning plans, sounds like a recipe for chaos. And I kid you not, in our own household, our Wi-Fi quivers in fear in the corner every morning at 9 a.m. 
wondering if he will be enough for this new day. I must, he must repeat these familiar words of the little Wi-Fi that could. I think I can. I think I can. Well, regardless, there are many of you who are in the midst of decision overload. We want to do the very best we can in the situation that we have in front of us, but nothing seems familiar. The very routine that we used to hold on to doesn't work. Our muscle memory doesn't hold up. The return to school routine, the return to the church program year, it's all going to be different. And it's exhausting. Nothing seems familiar. Everything seems new. When the response to pandemic times is to move into isolation and separation, what is the impact on an individual? What is the impact on our community? What does a community of faith do during these times? What does community mean when we are separated from one another? What kind of community will emerge out of these pandemic times? First, let's remember the story of God's people in the book of Exodus. If the Hebrew people learned anything during the time of their slavery in Egypt, it is that no matter how difficult their circumstances, no matter how loud their cries are to God, God hears them. And God responds. God sends Moses to deliver them, and this community remembers God's promises. God restores their community. And God provides a new way forward for them. God keeps the Israelites safe. God shows up and protects them. And like the Israelites, in our most challenging times, God sees you, God supports you, and God loves you. And maybe the same can be said for communities in conflict, inside the church or outside of the church. And I think Matthew is way less concerned in our text this morning, way less interested in the rules for rules' sake than he is for the rules for the community's sake. In particular, the rules that protect the vulnerable. Note here that Matthew's community feels pretty vulnerable right now. Jesus' instructions about resolving disputes or more acutely, the impact of our poor behavior, may reflect that Matthew's community was struggling with disputes and the impact and consequences of poor behavior. Usually we read these verses as a universal approach to conflict resolution, and not about Matthew's concern for the struggles of his folks. But as we know from experience, conflict can hurt. When members of a community show little regard for others, everyone suffers. The entirety of chapter 18, which we find our text in this morning, focuses on those who are vulnerable in our community and those that we care for. Just prior to our passage uh, comes Matthew's version of the lost sheep. In it, he points out that God's concern to not lose anyone in the community, not even one who has gone astray. So when fractures happen in a community, this text reminds us that even though it's hard, we should not give up. Try everything you can to hold a community together. In reality, very few of us readily move in toward conflict in our lives in our homes, in our families of origin, in our work life, and particularly the church. Many of us just run away, avoid, or we blame. But Matthew is offering us this lovely opportunity to keep engaged in conversation with the one we may disagree with, as challenging as that may be. And as we try to heal divisions in our families, and be equipped to heal divisions in our communities. And when we come together, God is powerfully at work. And nothing is impossible. 
Moreover, Jesus promises that when we are about this reconciling work, you know, that is when we come together as a community to address our own differences and to resolve our own disputes and seek an end to conflict and repair our relationships, God's with us. God is present. And Jesus reminds us, saying, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Always supporting us, encouraging us, blessing our efforts. That we, as Mark said earlier, we are not alone. And that is why we do not give up. And with the chaos and anxious unrest in our lives, this passage seems relevant to us. It's the helpful reminder to hear that God sees you, that God supports you, and that God loves you. After all, this strikes me as remarkably timely as we deal with the pandemic and economic upheaval and racial injustice and the cries for reform and the polarized political landscape. The heart of this passage is about Christian community, what it is and how it suffers and how it addresses hurt and what is a healed community to do. What kind of community are we going to be? Can we look at those around us and believe and affirm that even those who disagree with us on important issues are nevertheless loved by God? Can we imagine that the goal of our community is to nurture relationships both inside and outside of this church? And the challenging one, I think, as we turn the page towards election season, can we commit to going to great lengths, even tolerating those who disagree with us about who should be our next president, in order to engage each other in conversation, hoping that we will listen to one another? But we live in hostile and divisive times, for sure. We are not the first people to live through such conflictual times. This is not anything new. Heightened emotions, extreme polarities, intense levels of convictions, deep personal attachments to issues we now face are the markings or the makings of a perfect story that many feel ill-equipped to navigate. However, conflict is not new. It is not new on the world stage. It is not new in the church or in individual congregations or for church members. If we can count on anything, it is the fact that conflict will arise. Sometimes it comes in overt ways and sometimes in covert ways. So maybe the seventh lesson for living in pandemic times is that there'll be another lesson eventually, but the seventh lesson is that the community can remember and restore and renew its commitment to one another and chart a path for a future as a community that works together for good. One thing has come, become abundantly clear to me in this time of pandemic. I'm sure you know it. Life looks so much different. It has to. It has to look different because our collective future is at stake. What kind of people are we going to be through this and after this? What this crisis has illuminated is that we cannot return to normal. Because for so many, normal wasn't working all that well. Overworked couples with little time for connection, over-programmed children and youth with little time to connect, or breathe or have creative play. Maybe you feel that in your workplace as well. This was not a way to honor God and community and each other. The fast-paced nature of our world before COVID was unsustainable. And now we can't go back to what it was. And we must fight with every breath of our being to move forward in a new way. Because of this pandemic, we have had to, we have to replace our priorities with others. We have to put people over profit 
and place cooperation over competition. And above all, we have to access our collective abundance for kindness and generosity. People of God, may we live each day trusting in an abundant God, a God who acknowledges our pain, listens and hears us when we cry. And may we be surrounded by such a community of faith willing to remind us that we can do hard things, that we can stand up together for the truth-telling that needs to be heard in this community. And may you always, always know that God sees you, that God supports you, and God loves you. Amen.